Ryan. I'm excited to moderate this webinar. With uh, I'm with Health the Harm Network, and we're um, let's see the webinar today. Too dirty, too dangerous. Why health professionals reject natural gas. We're so glad that you've joined us for this important and definitely relevant topic. Um, I'll be moderating today's session, and before we get started, a couple of housekeeping things to talk about. So we are recording the session, which means that you can replay it and you can also share the link for the replay with other people that are interested in this topic. Also, if you have any technical difficulties at all um, in the chat, actually, I'm sorry about this slide. It should say chat Prathana because Prathana is here with us. Um, info at healthtoharm.net is still the correct email address, but Prathana is in the chat and she'll be um, gathering up some of the questions that we're going to be answering in the Q&A that our guests will be answering. And also after the webinar, we'll have a survey. And it's just a quick automated survey that will help us improve the webinars and, and um, just incorporate your, your advice and feedback. So that'd be awesome. So our panelists are going to present for around 30 to 40 minutes. And after they're done, we're going to have a Q&A session. So definitely stick around for that. It's really um, a time when you can bring up things and they'll have a chance to respond as well. So some open discussion. And uh, to ask a question, again, just put something in the chat there. Uh, Prathana is going to be gathering that up. Um, so now that we've gotten that out of the way, here are our speakers today. We're really glad to have uh, both Chad Oba and Barbara Gottlieb from Physicians for Social Responsibility, Chad's from Friends of Buckingham. So let me tell you a little bit about them. So Barbara is the Director of Environment and Health at Physicians for Social Responsibility. There she guides PSR's national work on climate, energy, and air quality. She's the lead author of and the co-author of PSR's major reports on health implications of fossil fuels, including this most recent report, Too Dirty, Too Dangerous, Why Health Professionals Reject Natural Gas. She's also involved with other reports such as Coal Ash, The Toxic Threat to Our Health and Environment, and Coal's Assault on Human Health. Our second presenter today, Chad Oba, is the co-chair of Friends of Buckingham County, Virginia, a community group concerned about a proposed gas pipeline and the impact it has on their property rights, their health and safety. Today, she joins us to talk about regulatory failure, environmental justice, and compressor stations. So what is Halt the Harm Network? Health the Harm is a national advocacy network that's designed to connect, serve, and support the dedicated individuals who are working to halt the harms caused by fracking. The network's goal is to expand and strengthen the base of leaders and supporters in the movement and facilitate collaboration by developing services that equip leaders with the tools and strategies they need to halt the harms of fracking, both in their local communities and then ultimately win the fight nationally. Since its start almost four years ago, the network has grown to more than 500 leaders and 12,000 supporters across 50 states. So who are the leaders of Health the Harm? Leaders in the network are individuals actively working and collaborating to help those living in communities negatively impacted by fracking. A leader can be anyone, whether you're a concerned parent organizing other parents at their school against local drilling or a career organizer who's working for a larger group. Leaders have access to free resources such as these you can see and services online, like our leader directory. On the directory, you can actually send messages directly to other members of the directory and also find links to their social media um, accounts. Campaign strategy, support, webinars like this, and event support, these are some of the few services that we provide at Health the Harm Network. So, um, on our website, you can find all of the past webinars as well. And which is an incredible resource just uh, alone. We're also looking for new ideas and, and uh, for webinars in the future. So you can definitely reach out to me personally and um, contact us um, at healththeharm.net. So now I'm gonna hand this over to our panelists, uh, Barbara and, and Chad, um, to start the presentation section of the webinar. So uh, Barbara, welcome. Well, thank you, Ryan. Thank you so much. I'm really delighted to be here. I'm so happy to be collaborating with Halt the Harm. And uh, thank you also to everyone who has tuned in for the webinar. 
Uh, fracked, fracked natural gas or methane is a, a key battleground in the fight to stop fossil fuels. I think I probably don't need to tell that to the people who are on this call. Uh, what I'm going to do today is talk about um, methane's uh, implications for human health. Uh, as as uh, Ryan mentioned, PSR has produced this report, Too Dirty, Too Dangerous, Why Health Professionals Reject Natural Gas. And what the report does is to cite and to summarize recent scientific studies that look at those health implications. So today I'm going to highlight a few of those findings. Um, and I, I hope that you'll use the information that I present today to help you make the case against frac gas in your community. But you know, more importantly, I really hope that you'll go to the PSR website and download this report. It's, um, it's chock full of information and of footnotes and electronic links to the original sources. So whether you want to read the scientific data or whether you want to um, read our kind of um, easier, perhaps sometimes easier to understand text, it's a really great research uh, resource. And that's why I'm here to share it. It's available on the PSR website at psr.org. And I'll give you that um, URL once again at the end of the presentation. Next slide, please. I'd like to start this conversation at the end of what I, what I have to say. The future of our energy production, like the future of our lives on this planet, lies in clean and renewable energy sources, things like solar, wind, and geothermal, and energy efficiency. Uh, and that's for several reasons. You know, the renewable energy sources will protect us from climate change. They emit virtually no heat-trapping greenhouse gases. They basically eliminate the need for mining, except for their initial manufacturer. They mean no fracking, no post-combustion toxic wastes like coal ash. And so the result of a, of a transition to clean energy is much cleaner air, much cleaner water, and much better health for people everywhere, as well as other benefits like new jobs, uh, no pollution hotspots, hot no sacrifice zones like the ones that we see associated with fracking, coal mining, and coal-fired power plants. So we get much greater health and greater health equity. Next slide. If we keep buying and burning fossil fuels, we won't get to where we need to get. And that's a particular concern right now with so many utilities that are moving to replace our dwindling supply of coal with natural gas or methane. But that's the wrong direction for us to go. Next slide. There's a large and growing body of scientific research that documents that natural gas causes serious problems. So as I'll recap in today's presentation, natural gas is too dirty. It results in toxic air, water, and land contamination, and too dangerous as a uh, climate change driver, uh, as bad as and possibly worse than coal, and something that endangers our health and ultimately our survival. Next slide. I'm going to go a little bit quickly through this because, again, I think that most of you, as um, folks who are concerned about fracking, probably know a lot of this. Um, and so I'll assume you're already familiar with the, the fracking process that's used to extract methane from deep underground layers of rock. But I would like to highlight that um, in, in this fracking process, there's a complex blend of chemicals that gets mixed with millions of, literally millions of gallons of water forced underground under high pressure. We know that um, many of the substances in fracking fluids are toxic. Um, some of them are carcinogens or they, they cause cancer in human beings, such as benzene, toluene, and arsenic. Some of them are neurotoxics, which means they affect the nervous system. That's the way doctors talk about it. Let's remember it really means the brain uh, above almost all other aspects of the nervous system. Uh, so ethylene glycol and lead. And then endocrine disruptors, those are chemicals that may that interfere with the body's endocrine system, which regulates human development, the reproductive system, the nervous system, and the immune system. So the health implications here are huge. Furthermore, the, as the chemicals contaminate the water, and then with a lot of the frac, whether that water is underground or brought back up to the surface, um, it's a toxic problem that we face. Benzene, which as I mentioned is one of the known carcinogens, is toxic in water at levels greater than five parts per billion. So that's part of what we know about fracking fluids. There's also a lot that we don't know. In many places, drilling companies aren't required to reveal the chemicals they use in their fracking fluids. It's 
it's a, it's PBI, it's proprietary business information. It's a, it's a trade secret. So as a result, when people are exposed to fracking fluids, and these could be workers or truck drivers or people who live where fracking is taking place, they won't know what they've been exposed to and doctors won't know how to treat them. Next slide, please. Another problem associated with um, fracking contaminants are the materials that come back up with the fracking wastewater. Um, fracking wastewater can bring with it naturally occurring substances that really, you know, we'd be better off if they stayed deep underground. So um, salts, radioactive materials, heavy metals, volatile organic compounds. I would just mention that um, the radioactive materials brought up in the Marcellus Shale here in the east include radon, which is the leading cause of lung cancer after smoking. I think a lot of people don't know that. Next slide, please. The most common air pollutants from fracking seem to be volatile organic compounds and particulate matter. Um, and these leak out into the air um, across the entire fracking, fracked gas supply chain uh, and can contribute to, as I've mentioned, cancer, but also the formation of ground level ozone, which we also commonly know as smog, which can cause irreversible lung damage and significantly increase the risk of premature death. The other um, major air pollutant is particulate matter, which isn't a single substance, but rather a, a category of um, substances gauged by their essentially microscopic size. These are tiny particles that go airborne. When we inhale them, they penetrate deep into the lungs. The smallest part uh, particulate matter particles can actually pass through the lungs into the blood and circulate through the body, doing extensive harm, as you can see from the slide. And like VOCs, particulate matter exposure can increase the risk of premature death. Next slide, please. So let's let's look a little bit about what we already knew, <clears throat> excuse me, already knew based on uh, scientific literature. Fracking results in dangerously high rates of exposure. Um, VOCs, volatile organic compounds, and the ozone pollution that uh, VOCs can form um, are often high in urban areas where they're emitted by cars and trucks, but they've also been detected at dangerously high levels at fracking sites, even in rural areas where you would not expect to see those high levels of air pollution. So for example, as the, as the slide says, um, Utah has been one of the um, areas where we've seen dangerously high levels of both VOCs and ozone. Uh, Colorado, dangerous airborne levels of benzene, the carcinogen, um, similarly in, in uh, northern Texas. Okay. So these are some of the risk factors that, we've, that we're exposed to by fracking. We already knew this. Uh, next slide, please. What, I, what I'd really like to linger on, and I'm going to take a little bit more uh, time on the, this slide and the next couple of ones, are what the more recent scientific studies show. Um, in recent years, there have been studies that have been published in peer-reviewed scientific journals. That's really the, the gold standard for scientific materials uh, that demonstrate not just risk factors, not just that the gas is out there and we're being exposed to them, as I was saying a moment ago, um, but rather the recent studies now show associations between living near fracking sites and actual health outcomes. That is to say, they demonstrate that people are getting sick. So here, here, are, here are two of the highly reputable studies that present evidence indicating that living near a fracking site can increase the likelihood uh, that you will experience a serious health effect. So the first one, the 2015, this is a study by the University of Pennsylvania and Columbia University researchers. They found a statistical association between well density and increased rates of hospitalization for, for a variety of conditions, including cardiac and cancer related. So what they did was the researchers correlated databases on hospital inpatients with a mapping of active fracking wells for gas and oil in three Pennsylvania counties. Two of the counties had um, increasing amounts of fracking activity. The other one, the third county, had no fracking activity during the study period to provide a kind of baseline. They looked at over 92,800 patient records. In other words, this is a really high volume study, which increases the likelihood of, of its accuracy. And they found association, as I said, between well density and increased rates of hospitalization for the conditions listed on the slide. 
In the communities with the most wells, the rate of cardiac hospitalizations was 27% higher than in the control county where there was no fracking going on. Now, the researchers noted that further studies are needed to determine whether specific toxicants or combinations of toxicants associated with fracking um, are associated with these organ-specific responses. So that, that's one study. And once again, if you'll, if when we're off the webinar, if you'll download the PSR study from our website, you'll find a link where you can go directly to the study and read it yourself. The 2016 study, researchers identified a statistical association between progressively worsening asthma symptoms and the patient's proximity, nearness, to natural gas fracking operations. So this study looked at the electronic health records of over 35,500 patients with asthma, again, a very robust database. And they studied um, four phases of the fracking operation as well as the distance from the patient's home to the well, the well characteristics, the dates and durations of these different phases. In other words, this was a very precise study. And then those metrics were statistically associated with, in, this, these are their findings, these associations with increased risk of asthma exacerbations from mild, which means people need a new medication order for an, order, uh, an oral corti corticosteroid, through moderate risks, which means people went to the emergency room, to severe exacerbations of asthma, which means the patient needed to be hospitalized. Now, the study noticed that noted that these are um, associations. Uh, they, they don't determine whether these associations are causal, is whether the proximity to a fracking site caused the asthma exacerbations. That's the kind of um, standard um, declaration that a, a medical scientist would make. These are associations, not causation. But I think when you look at the, the scope and scale of it, it's pretty persuasive. Once again, the citation uh, for the study and the links to the original are available on the uh, PSR website. The next slide, please. Among the most vulnerable to the problems associated with fracking are um, infants and young children. Um, there are a couple of very um, alarming studies, very worrisome studies of, about that. There was a 2014 study of almost 25,000 births. And here again, researchers found a statistical association between serious birth defects and the density and proximity of natural gas wells um, where the mothers lived. The study was in, conducted in rural Colorado between 1996 and 2009, and it deliberately excluded towns and cities of over 50,000 people. To This was to reduce the likelihood that other sources of pollutants were contributing to these outcomes. Um, the strongest association that they found was between, again, this density and proximity of natural gas wells within a 10-mile radius of maternal residence. So the fracking doesn't need to be taking place on your property. 10 miles is pretty big. And the prevalence of congenital heart defects. Birth defects are a leading cause of um, what doctors will call you, uh, will call neonatal mortality. For the rest of us, that's newborn babies dying. Uh, many of these birth defects are thought to result from interactions between um, both genetic factors and environmental factors. So when we look at, look at the um, suspected non-genetic risk factors for these birth defects, it includes uh, folate deficiency, maternal smoking, alcohol abuse, okay, no surprises there, right? And exposure to benzene, toluene, uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, or PAHs, and petroleum-based solvents, which include aromatic hydrocarbons. These are air pollutants that are emitted during the development and production of frac gas. Uh, finally, the, the 2016 study, so this is a study that was just published last year. Again, a statistical association was found between expectant mothers living in the most active fracking areas and an increased risk of high-risk pregnancy and premature birth. This particular study looked at the electronic health record data of over 10,000 births in northern and central Pennsylvania. And then again, they looked at information about the fracking wells, how close the wells were to the pregnant, um, the homes of the pregnant mothers, as well as the stages of drilling, how deep the, um, the wells were dug, how much gas was being produced, um, and then the uh, well characteristics, dates, and, and phases, and so on. Um, 
they used this information to develop an index of how active each of the wells were, how close they were to the women. And what they found was that expectant mothers, uh, pregnant women living in the most active fracking areas were at a 30% greater risk of a high risk pregnancy and 40% more likely to give birth prematurely. There's a lot that can be done um, nowadays for premature or preterm birth, but it still remains, listen to this, the single greatest contributor to infant death. Preterm birth accounts for 35% of all infant deaths in the United States in 2010. That's more than any other single cause, and that's according to the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC. Being born prematurely is also a leading cause of long-term neurological disabilities in children. The study, once again, does not state why the pregnant women had worse outcomes near the most active wells. They just stated that they did. Next slide, please. So that's, those are some of the um, really, really worrisome findings about the toxic, or what we call the dirty side of frac gas. I'm going to talk a little bit now about um, frac gas is dangerous in terms of uh, climate change and methane's effect on the climate. Methane, as you probably know, is a greenhouse gas, like carbon dioxide, but it's far more powerful at trapping heat. Now, there's good news. The good news is a methane molecule lasts only 12.4 years um, in the atmosphere, um, and after that, it breaks down. The bad news is it breaks down into carbon dioxide and water vapor, both of which are greenhouse gases. So although the methane no longer exists as methane after those 12 plus years, its breakdown products, especially that CO2, extend methane's impact on the climate for decades. So if we look at what happens to methane over 20 years, methane is 86 times more potent at trapping heat than CO2 over, over those 20 years, according to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC. So, so let's think for a minute about the next 20 years. The next 20 or 30 years are going to be decisive in determining climate change impacts. That's because of tipping points. Tipping points are, are critical thresholds. And, you know, we may be reaching one. We're, we're approaching the greater than 2 degrees Celsius temperature increase compared to pre-industrial average temperatures. Scientists think that if we pass that threshold, the following things may happen. The Greenland ice sheet could melt, causing significant sea level rise, and also exposing dark ocean waters, which, unlike the ice that melted, absorb more heat. Here's another thing that could happen. The Amazon rainforest would probably be facing lengthening dry seasons and droughts. And if the rainforest reaches a tipping point, we could see dieback of up to 80% of that rainforest, meaning the loss of a gigantic carbon sink. The Amazon um, uh, rainforest nowadays absorbs, because trees do this, huge amounts of carbon dioxide and give us back fresh oxygen to breathe, we could lose that. Finally, much of the world's permafrost would melt, releasing vast stores of carbon dioxide and methane from the soil, which would again yield even greater climate change acceleration. The concern is that parts of the world would reach unlivable temperatures. So that's the climate crisis that we need to avoid. That's why we must take into account methane's warming impact over this critical 20-year window and take action fast. Next slide, please. So to get back to, the, to fracking and, and uh, how methane um, gets into the atmosphere, we're aware that methane leaks into the atmosphere during every phase of the natural gas supply chain, from the drilling sites, from on-site processing, from transport, from storage, and from final distribution. The leakage starts at the well site. You know, the well bore, which is made of concrete, can crack and leak. In equipment and infrastructure can and do leak. There's also a certain amount of natural gas or methane that's released deliberately via venting. Uh, this sometimes happens in the early stages of extraction when drilling is going on, but the processing equipment isn't up and running. Um, venting also occurs from the compressor stations that push the gas through the pipelines on their way to delivery. Um, and there the venting serves to release, re reduce pressure buildups in the pipes. Um, and in either case, we see more releases of this potent greenhouse gas, more chances of, uh, well, I mean, let's look at it this way, of the intense hurricanes that we've been seeing uh, in um, the Caribbean and, and Florida, um, 
more of the drought and wildfire that's been ravaging um, the Pacific Northwest. Next slide. Gas, uh, methane also leaks from abandoned wells, and the number of abandoned wells in this country is pretty astonishing. It's estimated at 3 million. Many of them leak, as you can see over the, on the see on the slide. And as the years go by, the number of wells that leak increases. So once again, that's more methane being released into the atmosphere. And there are no EPA or nationwide controls on leakage from abandoned wells. Next slide. Thank you. There we go. Um, Methane also escapes from um, the compressors that pressurize the gas, as I said, that run through the, uh, the pipelines. Uh, a study conducted in the Texas Barnett Shale found that methane emissions from compressor stations were substantially higher than those from well pads. Uh, storage facilities may leak, as we saw from the massive leak at the Aliso Canyon facility in um, California. And the pipelines that carry gas from the well site to the utility company, and from the utility company to your home can also leak. Uh, and they leak not only methane, they also leak the volatile organic compounds that I referred to earlier and the radioactive materials. So that especially where you have a compressor station, you're in danger of exposure once again to the, um, the uh, volatile organic compounds which can affect your nervous system and provoke cancer and the radioactive materials. And um, Chad, my colleague, will be telling you more about pipelines and compressor stations shortly. Uh, next slide, please. And just to finish up, um, leaks, of, leaks of natural gas have been detected in many major cities where the distribution pipes run you know, down under our streets and up to our houses. A study in Boston conducted in 2015 found that um, Methane emissions from distribution pipelines and end use, that's, that's us, who when we, you know, you know the pretty little blue flame when you turn on the gas stove in your, in your kitchen, that's end use, um, were two to three times greater than had been predicted. And the authors of the study said that um, areas that consume natural gas, as, as distinct from those that produce it, uh, may represent areas of significant resource loss. So it's not just the fracking sites. It's all of us. Uh, next slide. So which fuel, coal or natural gas, would create less warming of the planet? Scientists disagree. There's not a clear-cut answer to this question. And you know, that's not surprising. It's, it's complicated. The time frame matters. Remember, um, methane is terribly potent at trapping heat over its first 20 years in the atmosphere. Its potency then declines as the decades roll by. Um, estimates of leakage rates matter a lot, and that's hotly debated. And then, you know, there, there's a room for um, significant improvement uh, via regulation or even via industry self-improvement um, in reducing the leakage rate. Um, but, you know, if you want more information on that, there's more in our study. I think there's a different takeaway, though, that's far more essential, and that is that choosing between fracked gas and coal is not our only choice. They're both fossil fuels. They both emit dangerous conventional pollutants that seriously harm health. They both drive climate change, putting the entire planet in danger. So we have much better choices for our energy fuel, such as wind power, solar energy, geothermal, and of course, energy efficiency. Next slide. Another thing I wanted to mention is that new natural gas plants that are built, uh, either built or that convert from being coal-fired, are likely to operate for 40 years. So choosing natural gas as um, an energy source for electricity generation extends our use of fossil fuels, extends these climate-damaging emissions far beyond the point of sustainability. At the same time, if we expand our natural gas use, we reduce the market for renewable energies, which uh, emit virtually no greenhouse gases and delay that desperately needed transition to clean energy. Next slide. So in other words, the choices that we make today about natural gas are implicitly choices about when and how quickly we transform our energy system. We need to choose and the choice is clear. 
PSR, Physicians for Social Responsibility, rejects natural gas. We opt for a future based on clean, healthy, sustainable energy for ourselves and our children. I'd like to thank all of you on this call for the, the great work that you do in um, fighting with us for this future. As I said, I hope you'll download the report from the PSR website and use it to reinforce your valuable, your life-preserving work. Um, the URL is right there, or if you just go to PSR.org, you'll find it on our homepage. So that wraps it up for me. I'd like now to pass the uh, microphone to my colleague, um, Chad Oba, who, as you heard, um, is the co-chair of Friends of Buckingham in Buckingham County, uh, Virginia, and she's also, I'm proud to say, a member of the advisory committee for PSR in Virginia. Um, let me just and mention that Chad is, is truly, excuse me? Um, go, go ahead. I just Go ahead. Sure. I'm just going to say that Chad is, is really, truly um, participating remotely. She's off in a very remote section of New Mexico this week and is actually on the phone but without an internet connection. So I may every now and then chime in just to let Chad know which slide we're on. Uh, Chad, you want to take it away? And real, and real quick, welcome, Chad. But real quick before you start, I just want to remind people that um, you can ask questions in the chat on the bottom right of your GoToWebinar control panel, and you can also send an email to info at healttheharm.net um, if you're having a trouble with the chat. Um, so with that, uh, welcome, Chad Oba. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, Barb. Well, um, I'm honored to be here today with everyone. Um, I'll be providing a grassroots perspective of how to propose fracked gas pipelines, the Mountain Valley Pipeline and the Atlantic Coast Pipeline are, affect, are impacting us in Virginia, um, and more specifically, the regulatory process that we are, are all progressing through right now. Um, and in, in Buckingham County, where I live, it was mentioned earlier, we're dealing with the proposed Atlantic Coast Pipeline. So where I'd like to start today is with where we are in the process, which is uh, we're dealing with the Department of Environmental Quality uh, under Virginia's Clean Water Act, their Section 401 certification reviews. Um, they have the authority and responsibility review and determine whether pipeline crossings meet specific water quality standards. So we're in that process right now. We completed the public comment uh, process of that. Uh, over 20,000 people made comments. So there's certainly a lot of concern for the uh, threats to our waterways um, as we're being faced with these two big pipelines. So what happens, or what we're concerned with, is that we're going to lose thousands of acres, national forest land in two states, West Virginia and Virginia. Um, mountaintops are going to be bulldozed and stripped. Thousands of streams crossed, including several headwaters that supply water for the most populated parts of Virginia and the District of Columbia. And as Barb said, all pipelines leak methane and compressor stations uh, that blow off toxic pollution that eventually has contact with our streams. Pipelines leak and explode all the time. And just as a sideline, our Hazardous Materials Safety Administration uh, and other regulatory agency uh, who are mandated to monitor pipelines only have one inspector for every 5,000 miles. So that's another regulatory inad inadequacy. So getting back to the Department of Environmental Quality, uh, can everyone hear me? Could somebody please let me know because I'm getting uh, yeah. some interference. Okay. I can hear you good. Yeah, thanks, Chad. Okay, thank you. But anyway, it's a very big task for the Department of Environmental Quality. They're, they're understaffed, um, and, and this is just, just a very, very important thing for them to be doing to protect us. Um, farmers who need water to continue their livelihoods are being threatened. Uh, contamination of well water is, it exposes an extreme threat to harm. 
And as I said, uh, those further downstream who depend on the public water supply are, would be affected. And, and in addition to that, there's going to be many, many biological species that will be harmed. So uh, right now, this huge project will really does require much more thorough analysis. And it's being pushed through very quickly to accommodate uh, Dominion Energy, who are building, wanting to build the Atlantic Coast Pipeline. Um, this is really just to accommodate their construction schedule. And this is going to be at very great expense to the public and to the environment, of course, and the water we all depend upon. So we're being compromised by a lack of sufficient time to review these documents. And often, even when they've, when they've been reviewed and the permits are approved and construction proceeds, there'll be violations by the industry. And what happens is they pay the fines, they proceed with construction, and the violations add up. And so the legal proceedings become long and complicated, and the pipelines, they're allowed to be, continue to be built. So our question is, is, is our Department of Environmental Quality really up to this task with these limited resources? Um, in addition to, do they really have the political will um, unfortunately, our governor is in favor of these pipelines. So we're just hoping that they will do the right thing, they will slow down the process, they will look at it carefully, and they will do what, what is needed. Um, in the end, what they can do is that there's three choices. They can grant it as proposed, grant with amendments, or deny the 4-1 certification. And we don't have a date yet as to when that will happen. Um, we've heard it may be as early as mid-November, but it may be later. And we're hoping it will be later because that means that they're really looking at it. So that's where we are currently right now in the regulatory process. But what I'd like to talk about is um, a little further is our specific situation in Buckingham. Um, and just to back up a little bit, uh, the Atlantic Coast Pipeline is a 600-mile, 42-inch gas pipeline running from fracking sites in the Marcellus Shale regions of North Central West Virginia, and then it runs through several West Virginia counties and runs western, then runs through western and central Virginia and then southeasterly into North Carolina. And 25 miles of this proposed line would run, would, would run through Buckingham. Uh, we are the proposed site of the only, the only compressor station in Virginia. Normally, these are built every 40 to 60 miles. Uh, a compressor station that we're getting, that they've proposed for us, has been increased in size three times to the current 53,515 horsepower capacity. That is a huge infrastructure, and that's almost tripled the original proposed size. So we're dealing with quite a bit, and so that's going to move me at this point into the environmental justice issues involved in citing this only compressor station uh, in Virginia where I live. Um, I live in a very rural part of the county, um, and I live at the edge of a largely 90% African American community. So what is exceptional and, very, and a very compelling part of our story here is that many of the same families are still here in this part of the county on mostly small land holdings in this very densely populated neighborhood, which was uh, originally found by slaves freed after the Civil War. Um, and so this is where they want to site this highly toxic, high-powered frac gas compressor station. Um, another part of the story is that the 68 acres that Dominion Energy bought for the uh, proposed Atlantic Coast Pipeline Compressor Station was formerly part of a huge plantation in this area. Um, Dominion paid a very big price for this property, $2.5 million to be exact, um, to be near the Transco line, which would make it easy for them to transport gas in every direction, um, including to huge export facilities. Uh, this piece of property was owned by an LLC company, Variety Shades, named after the plantation, 
and who we feel may be in part be the ancestral plantation owner descendants. So while those folks made a lot of money because people don't pay $38,000 per acre for land in uh, Buckingham County, a very poor county, uh, this transaction uh, left the freedmen people who worked that very same plantation, their ancestral folks who worked it, now their property is worth zero. So we will have reduced property values, if we could even have any value, and considerable impacts on our health and safety. So we did a door-to-door -door demographic study conducted by our group um, and students and volunteers, and we were able to reach 63 households and we were able to identify race, ages, number of people in each home, burial grounds nearby, any health conditions existing that would be worsened by breathing toxic air. And out of those 99 households initially identified in a mile directed in every direction, we reached 63, being 158 people or two thirds of the households. That, that came to approximately 90% African Americans. We then, with what history was available, um, and that was difficult, um, but there were, there, we do have a historian, several historians, black historians in the area, um, but the court, courthouse was burned by arson in 1866, the day after freedmen were permitted to own land. But we were able to identify that one third of those that we surveyed were freedmen, former African American slaves. And so this is, this, this is what happened with this information. We submitted it to FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, who will deny or uh, permit the application by Dominion. Uh, they never did this study by Dominion, and they largely ignored ours. Um, they only submitted that there were 29.2 persons per square mile. Dominion falsely characterized us in the draft environmental impact study, and FERC took that information and responded in the final impact study as no significant impact to minority communities. Although that may not be the exact wordage because I'm in New Mexico, I couldn't reference that. But that's essentially what it said. Um, in the end, we did, we, we did submit our own results, um, as did the Southern Environmental Law Center. Um, but we were essentially erased by Dominion and the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. So they never really did a real demographic analysis um, of who was near, how close, what health impacts there were on the existing population and so forth. So past history has shown an unwillingness of government agencies to serve and protect marginalized communities, even though under the National Environmental Policy Act, it is required for them to consider this, but it's not enforceable by law. Um, and something that I stumbled into that I don't know who might know in our listeners, but um, I think this is important, that under the Energy Policy Act of 2005, oil and gas operations were exempted from almost all of the existing and limiting federal air and water regulations. And this came about from uh, Vice President Cheney's Energy Task Force, now known as the Halliburton Loophole. Uh, Halliburton Corporation is one of the three largest manufacturers of fracking fluids, so they ben benefit greatly from this uh, dismissal of non-enforcement of health and safety concerns. Um, before becoming Vice President, Cheney was Halliburton's CEO. So I think you could easily say, follow the money. So that's, that's what I have to say about the uh, environmental justice aspects and how the regulatory process through the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission failed us. And now I'd like to move to health and compressor stations. Um, and I'd like to just say that Barb covered a lot of uh, the, the health effects of all the many, many chemicals and emissions from fracking. And most all of that also occurs uh, with a compressor station. All of that's going into the air. And a lot more of it is going during blowdowns, which happen from time to time. 
um, where a great deal more is blown out into the air. And it's usually during these times from our research uh, um, uh, in other parts of the country where there are compressor stations where people really become sick. That's when the symptoms really show up or during these blowdowns. So the first question my neighbors and I, when confronted with a proposed compressor station head was, of course, will it be safe? And this is after what we, after we actually learned what a compressor station was, and we had to educate ourselves and others, and we did a lot of presentations throughout the county, brought in uh, a lot of different folks to, to educate us, including Barb, and we were assured uh, by Dominion Energy that any air emissions from the compressor station would comply with all air quality requirements, which are established to protect the public health, safety, and welfare. And they said the very same thing to our local governing representatives, our board of supervisors, and to the public during hearings and different informational proceedings. And additionally, they told us we would not operate the compressor station if we could not operate it according to stringent air quality regulations. But we we found a lot of, we found there was a big difference from what they told us and what we were really discovering was happening around compressor stations and other information provided by researchers such as physicians for social responsibility and experts. <clears throat> Um, so we found that we felt that these statements were very misleading. Um, our compressor station is regulated by the State Department of Environmental Quality, <clears throat> excuse me, because it's considered a minor source rather than a major source. If it had been a major source, we would have come under the EPA's rule and permitting process. Even though cumulative effects from other polluters are not taken into account, we have in the county uh, already a highly polluting power station that is regulated as a major source. Uh, and Virginia has never done an analysis of air emissions in the entire state. Um, and in Buckingham, we currently have good clean air um, called the ambient, so-called ambient quality of air. Um, that's our baseline now. And because of this, um, ironically, they're allowed to pollute a lot, adding tons of toxic chemicals each and every day for 365 days a year, year after year. Uh, federal and state environmental laws and regulations are put in place to protect the health of regional populations and do not protect the health of groups most severely impacted. And that's important to know. Uh, they only look at the regional effect and not the in impact of those who live close in. And close in could be defined as much as one mile to 10 miles to 100 miles because the, the emissions, they do travel. Um, so this does not ensure that the air in the region is free of pollutants um, that cause illness and make existing conditions worse and shorten our lives. So even though it might meet our state air quality board's air standards, it's still saturated with dangerous chemicals with more added each and every day of our lives. Uh, Dominion, in our case, and the oil and gas industry in general, do not have the expertise of the qualifications for public, local, and state agencies to begin to understand the potential health impacts of existing or proposed compressor stations. Uh, they really don't do any health studies. Uh, we really are dependent on folks like uh, Physicians for Social Responsibility to, to do those types of studies. We were told, as uh, was the Department of Environment Quality, that all legal requirements have been met, and this does not ensure our health and safety. Uh, currently, there's no required baseline testing for health impacts to the air emissions from compressor stations. And our own research that we have done as Friends of Buckingham, uh, we found that there would be no health assessments done unless we, the people, organize it and fund it ourselves. Uh, it's, it's left up to us. There's only one place where, that we know of where there's an existing compressor station where a health impact study was what was done, um, and that was is in Madison County, New York, 
and it was funded by the New York Department of Health at a whopping price of, and this is what we've heard, um, $90,000. If anybody can um, verify that, I'd appreciate it. Um, but I, that's what we heard in, in conference with a lot of the folks up there. Um, so how can a poor community, we're a very poor community, cited for a proposed compressor station afford to do this kind of a health study? Um, but we feel that we have a right to know the number and the volume of deadly emissions and what health impacts they'll have and to have a scientifically independent sound health study before it's built. Um, essentially what we're being asked to do is we're, we're going to be exposed against our will to a very high level of pollution with many identifiable health risks that then generally uh, more affluent populations. Um, the Department of Environmental Quality is woefully underfunded and short-staffed. I mentioned that earlier when it came to the water testing. Um, when it comes to conducting a health impact study. So that pretty much is all I have to say and where we are with our regulatory process and where, what we've been dealing with uh, in Virginia. Thanks so much. Feel... Yeah, thanks, okay. Chad. Um, okay. we're, we're, we're looking at the last slide now of uh, Lifeland Water and uh, yeah. getting ready to move into the Q&A session. Okay. We have, yeah, that's our... we have, we have quite a few questions, which is, which is great, and about 10 minutes left. So we definitely want to jump in and get into the questions. Are you still here, Barb? I'm here, yes, I am. Great, so um, welcome uh, everybody that might have joined in partway through. There, there is going to be a replay. And thank you, Chad and Barbara, for the presentation today. Now we're in the Q&A stage. I'm gonna read off some of the questions that have come through in the chat. So starting with um, Paul, uh, is the mixing of fracking fluids and water able to be filtered, distilled, or chemically treated to purify the water. I can start us off on that. This is Barb. Um, I don't know whether there is in some uh, some obscure laboratory the capacity to do that. I think what's most important is that um, most uh, municipal waste treatment plants absolutely cannot do that. They cannot receive um, fracking wastes. They cannot filter it. They cannot allow it to be added to um, to either waterways or to our drinking supplies. And that's the reason why so much of the liquid waste from flat fracking are um, uh, so-called disposed of um, in, in underground wells, uh, which as we know in many places has uh, contributed to the creation of earthquakes. Great, and so the next question comes from Gail which says, how can we convince Congress that natural gas and its infrastructure is not a pathway to clean energy? We have the technology to transition to clean energy. Dad, you want to take a crack at that? I would, I would say you need to get active. Um, yeah, um, go, you know, write letters. Um, start your congressmen, let them know how you feel about this. Join organizations that are already fighting these things. Um, there's power in numbers. Great. And uh, there's a number of, of networking tools and, and things like that that are available that help make that possible. So next question comes from Alan. It says, is there evidence that FERC, as a result of the DC Circuit Court decision on the Florida pipeline has increased its consideration of climate change issues. Um, I have to confess, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, we have found FERC to be something of a black box, fairly impenetrable in terms of its, its internal workings, and I don't really know uh, what they consider or how much weight they, they give to uh, climate change considerations. I would say that we're still waiting to see them uh, turn down a permit request. Next yeah, question. I oh, yeah, go ahead, Chad. 
And I was just I was just going to agree with Barb on that. Um, FERC has, uh, you know, they're, they're basically a rubber stamp industry for the for, uh, well, the rubber stamp agency for the industry. Um, you know, we're always hopeful and we don't give up, but we're not expecting a whole lot at this at this particular stage. I would just mention that um, in response both to that question and to, to the prior, prior one about um, what can we do, um, there, there is a coalition of groups that on September 20th is going to be both um, protesting outside the FERC, but also uh, visiting congressional offices and lobbying to let them know just this kind of information. And maybe I'm a little bit biased, but I actually think that the information about the health impacts of fracking, um, of compressor stations, and of course the health implications of climate change uh, are a really good way to speak to legislators because who's going to come out against health? So Alan asks, I appreciate the health negatives from fracking and the global warming impacts of methane, but are there health consequences from the transmission line, compressor station leaks, for example? Can you expand on that? Sure. So I actually am not well informed about um, about health impacts from trans, uh, transmission pipelines. Many of the transmission pipelines are underground, and um, uh, abs uh, leaving aside the question of, of explosions, which is its own uh, obvious source of, of uh, danger to life and limb, um, I, I think there's very little data about leakage of pipelines. Uh, especially underground pipelines, other than at the point of compressor stations. Um, at, at the compressor stations, as, as I said before, there are um, yes, there, there's very clear evidence of, of uh, leakage, of health effects, um, certainly at the symptomatic level. Um, it, it's hard again to do to do scientific studies that are that determine. Uh, causation, and so you heard about that when I was talking about the, the fracking areas. That uh, scientists are willing to say there's an association, a statistical association between leakage and diseases um, in, in fracking sites. But there's very little data uh, because those studies are hard to do because the intensity of the leakage at a, at a compressor station would not compare to the intensity, the cumulative um, uh, uh, amount of leakage uh, in areas of high high density. Uh, fracking there's, so, more in, there's more in in the report in the too dirty too dangerous report available at psr.org and the report as well um we can send that out in the email along with the replay as well just to make sure everybody gets that link um so much of what Thank this you, webinar is about great. yeah yeah definitely so we have a couple more questions we're going to wrap up it is one o'clock um you know we can we can uh get a few more questions in just to make sure, um, even though we're going a little over time. So if you do leave, know that we'll send you the replay along with that report. I'm excited to get to a couple more questions. So Linda is asking, well, Linda says, this is great info and we will share it with local physicians and the doctors who is the head of our County Board of Health as we want to have a public health hearing. Are people aware of a bill sponsored by Tulsi Gabbard and other reps HR 3671 called the OFF Fossil Fuels or Healthy Future Act. People should contact the representatives to co-sponsor it. So that was sort of a, a question and comment. Yeah, PSR is actually endorsing uh, that the, um, the Gabbard bill and uh, delighted to see it. Um, and I, I, I uh, thank you for that comment. You're absolutely right. People need to um, let your members of Congress know that there are positive alternatives, both at the local level and also occasionally, as we see from this bill, at the congressional level. They, um, it's an uphill fight at this time, but that's exactly the fight that we need to be fighting. Thank you. And that connects to the question, too, about putting pressure on, on Congress. So, you know, being able to, yeah, reference these Health studies also show the alternatives. Uh, Jim is asking, are there numbers to show higher radon presence than in normal background amounts? Um, the short answer is yes, and I'm just trying to flip through my footnotes, and I think it's not a very good use of our time. Um, I can, I would, I guess I would just refer you to the, um, 
to the report, but but yes, I mean, there's when we say background um, amounts of radon, radon doesn't normally exist at, uh, at significant levels that, as a background gas. You probably heard about radon in terms of uh, it's it's the, it's the dangerous gas that you have to have your basement tested for. In other words, uh, if you're buying a home or if you have a home in areas where there is underground radon because radon can accumulate uh, at ground level or, or below ground level as, as in a basement. Um, I wouldn't call that a normal background level, so I'm not quite sure what the appropriate frame of reference or uh, comparison would be. But yes, radon um, uh, can accumulate. It is radioactive. I'm not really sure that there's a safe level involved. Betty asks, one question I'm frequently asked is what is the contribution to greenhouse gas to produce the large wind turbines and set them up, and also the cost of producing solar panels? That's a really good question, and I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know the answer to that question. We, we ask it ourselves. Um, I would. Um, so we certainly do acknowledge that any energy source will have um, uh, energy use associated with it in terms of um, mining or production, that's to say manufacture uh, and or uh, transportation. So clearly if you have to make um, steel uh, or, or other, um, you know, uh, even sometimes rare metal, uh, uh, st steel wind turbines or the rare metals that are used in the solar panels, um, all of these uh, entail some energy use and some environmental cost. I don't know the numbers that um, that are being asked for. I would though just remind us that um, once you've built the solar panels and the um, and the wind turbines, once they've been transported and put into place, at that point and over their productive lifespans, the pollution basically ends. Whether it's greenhouse gas emissions or uh, conventional pollutants, once you have those pieces. Um, in place, they are using energy sources, the wind and, and solar energy, that are free, that are clean, and that do not contribute to these, um, these um, toxic or uh, climate change burdens. So we have just a couple questions left, and there's still 50 people on, so we're going we're gonna to get to them. So Diana asks, are there any studies showing the impact of fracked gas leaking into water sources? Chad, can you take that? I think you're our water expert. <laughs> um, I, I really can't answer that. Um, I, it, you know, pipelines leak. They leak all the time. Um, imagine pipelines that go under rivers. There's the one uh, proposed, the, our proposed pipeline for the Atlantic Coast Pipeline um, goes under the James River. Um, I, you know, they leak. They leak all the time. And I'd like to just say at this point that uh, a big health impact is people lose their lives. Many lives have been lost due to pipelines exploding. If, if I can chime in on that, and again, I don't have, I don't, have, I cannot name a study for you, but if I may, if I could recommend the, um, the, the movie, the video Gaslands, which I think does document. Um, leakage of uh, leakage of methane, not necessarily from pipelines, but from fracking operations into nearby aquifers uh, and streams and into um, the water sources that rural people use for their water. So not necessarily your municipal water system, but people's wells. And you've probably all seen that, that famous footage of um, the guy turning on the faucet in his kitchen and striking a match to it and his, uh, the water in his kitchen sink goes up in flames. So we have that kind of, um, if you will, circumstantial evidence. Yes, and I'll add to that, in rural areas, they use thinner pipes. And, uh, and this is just a personal thing that happened to me, but my, my own water was tainted, actually, um, by a pipeline. I'm right across the road from a lateral line of a transco line, and I noticed that my water, when I leave it out for my animals to drink, would be covered with a film. And I wondered about that, and uh, lo and behold, uh, Transco came through and did uh, upgraded their pipes and did some repairs in the area, and it disappeared. So um, eventually, eventually, it took a while. So yeah, it do, it does get into wells. It does certainly. There's a concern with with pipelines leaking. 
into water supplies. I mean, that's what this is all about. What, that, what, this is the current uh, place where we are, Department of Quality, um, to look into these types of things. Great. And so the last question, and then we're going to wrap up, comes from Mark. It says, with, with so much information out there, why do so many still not accept the fact that fossil fuels are truly leading to our demise and slowly killing us? Is it intentional ignorance, stupidity, propaganda? What's your assessment? <laughs> are we <laughs> allowed to one. say all of the above? Yeah. Let me, I, would, I would say a couple of things. Um, I would say three things. One is that where these where um where fracking is not taking place, where the infrastructure is not being built, although those things are are pretty widespread, there are a lot of places where they're not visible. And so I think for a lot of us it's a little bit out of sight, out of mind. People have busy and, and complex lives and heaven knows there's plenty other things going on in the world that, that grab our attention and that need our attention. So, you know, I, I wouldn't be too hard on people in that regard, but I would say a, a couple of other things. One is, let us not forget that the Exxon Corporation knew about climate change some 30 or so years ago and suppressed the information because it could be bad for the sale of their product. In other words, not everything, uh, yes, there is propaganda, uh, it is not accidental. Yes, there are major vested interests. We're fighting against the oil and gas industry, folks, and it's one of the major um, economic forces in our uh, in our society. Uh, we're dependent at this point on oil and gas, and I, that leads me to my third and final point, which is that a lot of people, you know, they hear things about climate change or they hear things about fracking, and it sounds bad and it sounds ominous, and they don't see the alternatives. You can't. Mm -hmm just make the negative case to people because it has a chilling effect. People feel, I mean, they're terrorized and, and you know, they're, they're terrified, excuse me, and they should feel terrified because it's a really scary prospect. But if you don't have the hope that there's a positive way forward, what can you do? So that's why if you'll remember, I started my presentation um, with uh, the hope for the future that lies in, um, in clean, renewable energy. That's where I ended and that's, that was not accidental. That's actually um, based on recommendations from uh, climate-focused communications experts, such as um, uh, Ed Maybach at the George Mason University in Virginia. Um, you can Google him. It's M-A-I-B-A-C-H, Ed Maybach. Um, have lots of studies about how to communicate to people about um, climate change or these rela uh, related fossil fuel issues. and. Um, let's remember that to be effective communicators, we need to talk about the, the coming transition. I mean, the transition that's already happening to clean renewable energy. And um, we need to hold that in our own hearts as well so that we maintain our own strength uh, to keep these fights up. Yeah, awesome. I, I would just have to say also that I think most people are unaware on, on concerned is that um, with unconventional gas development um, is because they don't live in areas where the fracking or the compressor stations are sited. Um, so it, it's, they don't see them. What the eye can't, the eye doesn't see it. And, and so, yeah, we have to give the, we have to give people hope though. I agree with Barb. There need to be alternatives. There need to be answers. So. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Chad and Barb, for, for coming on and giving your presentation today. I really, it, this has been this has been awesome. We've, we had a great turnout. And um, I want to make sure everybody knows that as soon as you close this window, you'll get a quick survey. It'd be really helpful to get your advice and feedback about the webinar. This is part of a series that we're doing uh, with Help the Harm Network, where we have a number of things scheduled coming up. Um, so you can also contact us at info at healthtoharm.net. And I also want to encourage everyone to check out uh, PSR.org and also check out Protect Buckingham County, Virginia. So, um, and of course, healthtoharm.net, um, you know, to sort of end on a note of things that you can do. Also, the services that we're providing, the tools and services at healthtoharm.net, not just the, the leader directory, where you can uh, connect with other people around the country based on their skills, based on their interests, but a number of services 
tools that we have available like campaign support um, you know and the emails we've got services around uh, litigation and zoning also crowdfunding so you know more than just the webinar series but because you've attended we'll make sure to send you an invite to create your profile in the directory and start accessing those services so yeah thanks everyone so much um, and thank you, of course, Barb and Chad, and thanks, Prathana, for, for doing backup. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. All right. Take care, everyone.